Good morning, Triangle Grace. Uh, it is wonderful to come together this morning, this beautiful morning, to worship our Lord and Savior. Would you stand as you are able, as we join together, call one another to worship using the words of Psalm 15. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 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 The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. The Lord lives. Praise be to my God. Exalted be God, my Savior. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. Be 
is all for your glory. In this Easter season, we thank you for the knowledge that you have conquered the grave, that you conquer all of the things that wish to hold us captive. You have set us free, and those who are in Christ are free indeed. Lord, we praise you for who you are, for your beauty and your justice and your creativity and your goodness and your gentleness. Lord, we thank you for who you are, what you have done in each of our lives, Lord. This Easter season, we are reminded of your power and your goodness and that we can rest in the knowledge that you will overcome, that you win, that all of the things that bind us are temporary, are nothing compared to your power and your love. Lord, we join together in saying what we believe and affirming what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Lord, we believe these things, or we try to believe them, but Lord, we ask that you would help our unbelief, that you would help us in the places where we need to see more of you. Lord, we say we believe in the forgiveness of sins, but sometimes we believe that you are waiting to judge us, that you are only showing us mercy reluctantly. But Lord, Easter shows us that you have conquered it. You have conquered sin, and it no longer holds us. So Lord, now we release it to you. We confess our sins to you, knowing that you are our good and loving Father. Lord, your scripture tells us that if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. Lord, help us to believe that, to see newness of life in all areas of our lives, to be able to spread the good news of your mercy, of your love to those around us. Lord, we thank you for this truth, that you have gone to the cross and that you have left the tomb empty so that we might be set free. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Brothers and sisters, because we have peace with Christ through Christ, we also have peace with one another. So now let us share signs of that peace. Oh, it is so good to be together this morning. I hope you were also able to be together with us last night. We had our Songs of Hope candlelight concert, uh, which explains our backdrop today. 
Uh, and we want to thank, as they head out, uh, Hanukkah <laughs> and... <laughs> and Lori and Scott and Isaiah and Matt and Alex and Emily. It was just such a wonderful night of worship and uh, seeing the talents uh, of our Lord displayed in the creativity of those um, among us. And it was just, I hope that you were able to be there. If you were not, we missed you. Um, but we're just so grateful uh, that you were able to come. Uh, just a few announcements uh, about things that are going on in the life of our church. As you can see, if you look through your bulletin, there are many things. One of them is next week we are celebrating Nancy Holton's 30 years of faithful ministry to TGC. Uh, and we really want her to feel the love that we have for her. Uh, so if you have, you can send cards to the office, you can send videos to the office. Uh, if you wanna give monetary gifts, those can also go to the office. But there will be a celebration next week after the service. The bird is thrilled, just cannot wait. Uh, so. We would really just love to smother Nancy with love uh, next week. So uh, please be a part of that in uh, whatever way you feel led. Uh, we also want, this morning we began, uh, re-began some classes, Sunday classes, and started a new one, uh, the John class that Richard Draffin teaches and the fellowshipping class that is studying the Sermon on the Mount, re restarted, and you are welcome to join either of those. They are wonderful classes. Also, Gary Kreitz began a class about those times in our lives when God is silent or seems to be silent, which I know uh, I have gone through and we all have gone through, might be going through right now. So that, those are all wonderful opportunities to learn together, to uh, get to know one another, and uh, so you are welcome and invited to join in any of those opportunities. Also, I just wanted to highlight that in a few weeks, the club's musical is happening. That is on the 28th, and we will be having a uh, spaghetti dinner beforehand to help raise money for our uh, upcoming Costa Rica mission trip. So you really wanna come to that. You don't wanna miss either one. Uh, and speaking of the Costa Rica trip, I want to invite forward Pastor Jeff and um, Bob Bradley. Thank you, Molly. So, Bob, come on forward. It's a joy of ours to be able to share with you about Costa Rica. And I'm going to invite some of our other uh, leaders and uh, students that are going there. Uh, Megan, would you come forward? Jake and Charlotte. Thank you. And if you're not coming forward, if you're going on the Costa Rica trip, please stand up so we can uh, see you. If you are here today, go ahead and stand up. There you go. There's three over here. There's some others that are going. There's one up there. Uh, we have 14 students going. And I will say we actually have a few students today who are not here. They're at a church um, in eastern North Carolina sharing about our Costa Rica trip even today. So, uh, so they are there, but we want to share a little bit more with you about Costa Rica. And so, Megan. Yes. Um, first, we just want to say thank you for all the support you all have already given us, will give us, um, in, through prayers and financial support. Um, these kids have already done a lot for this trip. We have met multiple times talking about culture, talking about language with Jen Kirshner, who was able to give us a, a Spanish lesson, um, and just really talking about what does mission work mean? What does this mission trip mean for our youth? As it's the first trip we've been on since COVID, what does it mean for our church, and what does it mean for us as Christians? Um, and Bob, um, Elder Bob, and our lovely Jake and Charlotte are gonna talk a little bit more about that. But just wanted to say a quick thank you already for the support that you've given us. Um, it means a lot, and we're excited to um, be blessed by this trip. We already are, and once we get back, we're excited to share a little bit more about that with you. So I will go ahead and pass it over to Elder Bob, who is, um, we call him Elder Bob, but Bob is uh, the Elder of Global Missions, and I will go ahead and, and pass it over. Thank you, Megan. Uh, as the Global Missions Elder, 
uh, for Triangle Grace. Uh, Pastor Jeff has graciously invited me to participate in, in the meetings with the youth and the leaders as they prepare for this trip. So uh, I've had the privilege of having a front row seat uh, as the students learn about cross-cultural ministry. Uh, I've seen them affirmed and encouraged and supported, and I've seen them pushed and challenged and exhorted. Uh, and I want to join in that uh, of both affirming and exhorting the rest of us, uh, but hold that thought for just a, a moment. So uh, just for some context, uh, about a year ago, uh, as a church, we went through this process of developing a Vision 2030 about where we see God leading us as a church in the coming years. And we came up with four trajectories or directions uh, that we believe God's leading us to go. And one of those was about est establishing and, aff and affirming and building on our culture of missional impact. And so, uh, so, and one of the strategic initiatives within that is uh, about mission trips. And guess what? The youth are leading us uh, out onto the mission field, but this is not a youth only trip. We'd like this to be seen as a church wide initiative. We are all part of this trip to Costa Rica. We have different roles, but we all have skin in the game. And so this is where I want to uh, affirm and exhort you, affirm you for your financial giving to support, uh, to support the students and the leaders on this trip, uh, to affirm you for your prayerful support to date uh, for the participants on this trip. And I want to exhort you not to miss out on the blessing of being part of this trip. So some specific ideas for you. I have five quick ones. One is to give financially as the Lord provides and leads you. Secondly, you can read about Costa Rica and its spiritual needs. Uh, a website, for example, is joshuaproject.net, where you can, see, uh, you can search on Costa Rica and see that Costa Rica has over 5 million people, 21 identified people groups within the country. You can drill down on any and all of those and learn about their spiritual needs. Um, uh, at that site, joshuaproject.net. Uh, you can pray for Charlotte and Jake and Megan and Pastor Jeff and the others going on the trip. Uh, I encourage you to get to know one or more of the members of the trip. And if you don't know them, uh, any of us are happy to introduce you to them. Many of them have never left the US before. And uh, so it's a, it's a unique and exciting opportunity. You can ask, for them, ask them what they're excited about, what they're nervous about. You can ask them specifically how you can be praying for them. And finally, you can pray for the Costa Ricans that they will be uh, partnering in ministry with. So in sum, this is a, a Triangle Grace mission trip. When someone is really driven and focused, we say, he's on a mission or she's on a mission. And uh, with respect to this trip, we'd like to say we are on a mission. Charlotte. So the leaders on this mission trip are going to be Pastor Jeff, Megan Saunders, Rob Bray, and Mike and Jill Schultz. They have taught us that while we will only be in Costa Rica for one week, we actually commit to 10 months. And this includes having fundraisers and vision meetings about every three weeks. After the trip, we will host two more times where we will thank you all for joining us, show you our pictures, and tell stories of the mission trip. We know that many of you have already received our letters asking for prayers and for you to partner with us financially. We want to thank you for all of your generous donations and prayers. We see that you are joining us not only for the week, but also for the months leading up to the trip, and we are very excited to share our stories with you when we return. Yes, we really appreciate all the prayers and financial support. None of the youth in this group have been on a mission trip before, so it's really exciting for us and our parents. Your prayers are very encouraging, and we'll be setting up a mission prayers team to regularly pray for us and our new friends in Costa Rica. In addition to our letter writing, we'd like you to be our guest at a spaghetti dinner we will host that Pastor Molly talked about for the Kids Club Play on April 28th at 6 o'clock. This is an important day for the church because the Kids Club is performing right after, and we can all have fellowship together, eating food, bulking together. <laughs> so you can come get a good meal, and donate to our mission trip. Yep. Anything you want to say? 
Anything you want to add? No. Okay, great job. Thank you all, and we thank you all. Uh, you have either already received or will receive um, a, um, more information in the e-news and the QR code. Um, so th th you can learn more about our trip there, donate more um, there as well. We had to raise about how much together? 43,000. 43,000. I think we've we got about 10 more to go or 12 or something like that. Uh, but thank you for your support. Thank you all. At this time, we'd like to invite the children of the church to come forward, please, with Pastor Chris. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Any more kids out there? Let's see. There they come. Well, you can see <clears throat> what I have in my hands. Um, what's this? What's this? Milk. And what's this? Cookies. Milk and cookies. What a way to start our day off, huh? Um, you know there's a book about milk and cookies. Uh, does anyone? It, it has to do with a... The yeah, the mouse who... How's it go? Give a mouse a cookie. That's it. Give a mouse a cookie. It, it's, a, it's a great little book, and it starts off with some chocolate chips. And if you give uh, a mouse a cookie, what's he going to ask for? Milk. milk. Yeah. And if you give him some milk, then what's he going to ask for? Do you remember the next thing? Uh, not yet. Not a napkin, but a straw to drink the milk. And then uh, when he uh, drinks the milk out of a straw, then uh, he's going to ask for a napkin to wipe his face. And then he's going to ask for a mirror to look at to make sure that he actually got his mustache off. And what's up, Daniel? They like cheese? Yeah. My still ain't. Well, they, they actually like lots of things. I've had them in my house. <laughs> and, um, and it just goes on and on and on. And it's amazing of what happens. You know, they're called consequences, right? When you do one thing and that leads to another thing. And that leads to another thing, and it leads to another thing. And all of a sudden, you're somewhere else because of all these consequences that you didn't even realize when you just did the first thing. Well, you put the cookie down, and you put the milk down. It does look so desirous, too, doesn't it? Well, you know, that's actually in the Bible, in the part of the Bible we're looking at right now, Genesis 3 and Genesis 4 and 5 and 6, it's a really good description of how actually sin is talked about. It looks really good. It's desire. It's like, wow, I just want to, I want to have that. Uh, but then you take a little bite and then all of a sudden something else happens. And, you know, maybe when you do something naughty, <clears throat> you break something. And when you break something, what happens? Then you try to cover it up. And then what happens? Oh, then maybe your parents see what you broke. And then what happens? You run to your room and you hide. Then what happens? Then they come and find you and say, what did you do? And then what? It's just consequence after consequence after consequence. And it all started with a yummy cookie or, well, yummy. Something that looked yummy and good to do. Well, we're going to talk about that in big church, but... I want you to just remember that a little bit too. That, you know, sometimes the things that we know we shouldn't do, if we do it, there's going to be consequences and it often leads to disaster. So maybe it's better not to start that line of consequences to get to that point. Just say no, 
to the first thing. And then you never get there. So think about that. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to say no to things that end up causing bigger problems in our lives. And we ask that you would um, forgive us when they do and help us to be able to start all over again and maybe next time to say no. Lord, thank you for your love and that you walk beside us even, even when we're naughty. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to go back uh, with your mom and dad, continue worship here, or you can head out to Kids Church. We'll see you later. And as they do, let's sing together, prepare our hearts. Uh, Lori? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Amen. It was a great uh, night uh, last night. That's why the candles are still here. We'll take those down. But I'm so glad those were able to, to join us. Um, Lori and Scott, thanks again for, uh, for your leadership. I did want to point out also Alpha starts uh, on Thursday. If you're interested in exploring Christian faith, uh, questions about faith that might be on your heart or mind, uh, join Joe and others uh, for just a, a really lively um, safe uh, and important uh, discussion about life through that Alpha program. You can find more information about that in the bulletin. So um, you, you saw um, I, Isaiah, my son's with us, uh, and I, I thought I would bring uh, this and show you that this is uh, one of the, the blankets. I, th I think we were trying to debate whether this was Isaiah's blanket when he was a baby. Uh, or if, if this was Amanda's, uh, but Isaiah had one that was just like it, if it was, because they, they both had one that had this back on it. You can see it's, it's Noah's Ark. Uh, it's hard to see, but all those little basket-looking things are actually Noah's Ark, and there's a picture of Noah's Ark here. And when uh, the place where uh, Isaiah and Amanda shared a bedroom and apartment uh, when they were three and Isaiah was born, Laura painted with a, a stencil Noah's Ark all the way around uh, that. And uh, later on, we bought them Noah's Ark Playmobil. If you know what Playmobil are, those little characters and had this wonderful, you know, filled with animals. And uh, later on, uh, Josiah got to be an animal in Noah's Ark with a children's cantata like uh, we do here. We, there was one we had done uh, uh, back at my previous church uh, focused on uh, Noah's Ark. And, and that's what we're, we're talking about today, this, this uh, story, this event about uh, this great flood and, and Noah. And, and this is what we most often picture, isn't it? Uh, lovely kind of cartoonish scenes of, of animals, giraffes sticking their heads out of a window and uh, they're, they're being cared for and protected by a warm and jolly old man and his wife. And uh, that, those are the kind of pictures that often come to mind when we consider the story that we uh, are turning to. And but when we looked at it this week uh, in our staff meeting, the first thing uh, our children's director, Nancy Holton, said is that there's actually nothing in this text that you, act, that you feel comfortable sharing with children. 
It's, it's just not safe. It's, it's not easy. In fact, the, the, the tenor of the whole story is just unsettling for those with a tender heart. And so we're, we're going to take a look at what happens in Genesis 6 and Genesis 7, 8, and 9 over the next three weeks and, and consider uh, what, what unfolds. This week, we're just going to look generally about the event, the flood, and, and consider some aspects about that. Next week, we'll look at Noah's, Noah himself and his family and his life and his heart and, and, and what unfolds in, uh, in relationship to him. And then uh, the following week, then what happens after uh, the flood and uh, what unfolds as the flood receded. So let's look at Genesis 6. We're going to read verses 1 to 14, and then also verse 17 I'm going to add at the end. Here's, here's what's written. When man began to multiply on the face of the land... And daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. They took as their wives any they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. Uh, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man uh, was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And then skipping down to 17 says, I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray, Lord. We do ask uh, that you'd give us wisdom and a heart to understand and accept the truth that's embedded in this passage. Lord, we acknowledge your goodness. We ask that that goodness may come to bear in our lives as we meditate upon your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So you heard uh, Nancy's response uh, to the story of Noah. Lori's response, our music director, was one that was wholly different. Uh, Lori had been uh, serving within the university for many years, within academia. And as we read it on Wednesday, Lori uh, said that, you know, her colleagues within the university, just they, they just simply dismiss 
this story itself is, uh, it, it, it undermines the credibility of scripture, they would assert. Uh, she says she sat through classes where uh, this kind of story uh, is absolutely assaulted. It, it's, it's cast aside as a fanciful myth, uh, underdeveloped thinking of, of ancient times. And I guess we need to take that into consideration before, you know, can we even, is, is this just a story with a lesson? Or is this something that actually happened? And if so, uh, what's the implication of that? And can, can a catastrophic flood like this happen? Uh, a flood that would kill all of humanity. Uh, could it happen? And, and I guess I just start by mentioning floods. Do floods happen? Uh, they, and you know they do. Last September, uh, 19 people died from a single flood in Guatemala. In October, 37 people died from a flood in Brazil. The following month, 21 people died from a single flood in the Dominican Republic. And, and so like every single month, there's a flood, even in our modern day with the houses, the way we have houses and things like that, where people, a significant amount, die. In our history of modern day record keeping, uh, there have been 70 floods that have killed over a thousand people. There are 21 floods that have killed 10,000 people or more. Eight of those floods have killed 100,000 people. That's a lot of people. Three floods have killed over a million people. Two floods have, one which occurred in China in 1887, killed as many as two million people. And another flood in uh, 1931 killed as many as four million people in China. And we just heard about Costa Rica having five million people. So four-fifths of Guatemala would have been wiped out in one flood if it had, been, had it been in Guatemala instead of in China. So is it possible that a flood can kill lots of people? It, it sure can. Uh, just by natural circumstance that we're familiar with. Uh, but, but can a flood like go across? the entire world, you know, can it cover uh, the globe? Verse 17 says, For behold, I will bring a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which uh, is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on earth shall die. That, that gets a little bit harder, isn't it? Like, oh, okay, whole, whole thing. Um, from a scientific perspective, this admittedly presents challenges. And I mean, if you were to take rainwater, all the, the clouds in the air, and just take all the water that's up there and just drop it on the earth, it, it would like raise the sea level by one inch. Uh, so uh, if you were to melt all the polar ice down, uh, you know, we're worried about that with climate change and things like that that people talk about. That it melt it all, and now the seas are going to rise 250 feet. It's a lot. Maybe add to that, so you got the inch, you got the 250, add to that all the water in the ground. Uh, now we're getting up to maybe 400 feet across the globe. And that's catastrophic. I mean, goodbye Outer Banks. Uh, Louisiana's gone. Florida's gone. We would probably need to move to Greensboro. We're, we're about 400 feet here above sea level. Go to Greensboro, 850, we're safe. You know, you got oceanfront property. Uh, it, it, it should be. Uh, in, 
the average elevation of the United States is 2,500 feet. Uh, Mount Everest is 29,000 feet in the air. So, you know, you kind of hear this like, oh, could all the water in the world, as we know it right now, uh, cause a worldwide flood? It, you know, maybe the earth was different then. Maybe the mountains weren't as high. Maybe there was more water in the world at that point. And, you know, that's, that's all possible. And, and what's even more possible is that the God who made the heavens and earth and made the waters and the seas could certainly make more water and have that water dissipate if he so pleased by his sovereign power. But I, I do want to note uh, a, a significant translation issue that, uh, that may come to bear on this, this particular uh, topic. The, uh, it, it, almost all the Bible translations, they all translate the Hebrew word eris. Uh, in this particular context, they, they uh, translate it as earth. And that's an absolutely fine translation of that word in and of itself. And maybe some of the context you know, leads to that particular translation. But if you look out through Hebrew, through the rest of the Bible, and in Genesis itself, you're going to find that the word eris is more often translated as land uh, instead of earth. Like a geographic region. That in Genesis 41, that's how it's translated. Remember, uh, there's a famine. Where is it? In the land. And, and uh, it, it, 41, uh, it, it says, So when the famine had spread over all the land, Eris, could say all the earth, but in this case they translate it as all the land. Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph, to buy grain. That now, Eris is being translated as earth instead of land. Uh, moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. I don't, you know, when you read that, are, are you picturing people from China and, and Australia getting in boats with, you know, everybody from the entire earth globe are all coming to, no. You know, when you read this, you, you're, you, you're, you, you, you naturally go, oh, land, earth, the whole world. We use that kind of language ourselves. World War II. Does that mean every single nation in the entire world uh, was in battle in every part of the... No, it, it, it just kind of meant our world. Or in Acts chapter 4, it says that the, the, the apostles were turning the world upside down. Does that mean the apostles in Acts chapter 4 were you know, in, in the Americas, turning, no. But we use the word eris, the word, the idea of world and earth, uh, sometimes just to mean our region, our, our known world, everything that's important, the, the important place to us. So, so all that is to say, yes, God could have added more water and done something to flood the entire earth. But it's a fair translation as well to consider that this may be a regional flood, an area that was actually uh, had significant floods happen to it uh, at a time where the dispersion of peoples had not happened yet that we read about in chapter 10, where they're all in the same place, where the entire world doesn't have to flood. The non-negotiable here is that all of humanity was wiped out. But they could have all been pretty much in this region where this happened. So, you know, I, 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 I do think 
that a flood like this could happen and could wipe out humanity. And the question is, did it? Is this just a, a, a fanciful story? Scientists have been working at that. Geologists and uh, archaeologists, you know, they're excavating areas. In 1920, Ur and Kish, uh, areas of Mesopotamia. There, there were flood deposits found from uh, 2500 BC. And, and, and that group of scholars said, oh, this must be the flood. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But a flood happened. Uh, in 2000, there's a Smithsonian Magazine article uh, detailing the work of two Columbia University, you know, New York City, Columbia University professors who took soot cores from the Black Sea Basin. And they found that a catastrophic flood happened where the Mediterranean poured into the Black Sea turning it from fresh water to salt water that covered the entire region. Was that the flood? That, that happened 7,500 BC. Maybe. The, the, Genesis doesn't give us a date when this flood happened. I, I actually think it probably happened much longer back. 40, 50,000 before, from the scientific perspective, migration began to happen. It probably happened beyond that period. But that, all that to say is there's signs of significant floods just from a scientific perspective. Which one it is, you know, who knows. But I th there's another compelling reason to, to at least consider that this may have happened, an actual event in history. And it's because there are multiple accounts of the story of a man in a boat and his family who were the only survivors of a flood. It isn't just in the Bible. In fact, there's over 200 chronicled stories of a flood just like this in different uh, nations, people groups, tribes around the world. And the stories maintain this, this surprising consistency. Oh, they're, you know, they're, they're different. Their gods are different. Their outcomes are different. There's fanciful, crazy stuff that happens in different ones of the stories. You can look them up. Uh, the Babylonians had the story of Atrahasis. The Sumerians had the story of Gilgamesh. The Aztecs. I mean, think about where the Aztecs were. Uh, they wanted, uh, they, they described their god, uh, Tikkakwakan, uh, who warned a man named Note, Note, N O T E, and his wife, uh, Nina, of a coming flood. And not, uh, Note and Nina, they hollow out a cypress tree. And, and the god Tikkakwakan, they, he seals them inside of this boat. Look it up. There's all these stories all over the world about this flood. Uh, Greece, Hindus, Chinese, Norwegian, on and on, on you can go. What, how, how does this happen? What's the... Uh, with such a geographic distribution. Well, we all just have floods, and so, you know, maybe some people just came up with the flood story, and it just happened. Well, why not an earthquake story? Because there's earthquakes everywhere, too. Or how about a fire story that wipes out all of humanity, and, you know, they're, they're covered in some kind of, I don't know, goo or something that causes them not... Well, no, it's this flood story. I think the most reasonable explanation of this is that it, it occurred a part of history. That it was a shared understanding as an event that then spread across the world. And of course the testimony of scripture itself, right? We, uh, Noah is mentioned in the genealogies of Genesis. Noah is mentioned in the genealogies of Chronicles. The prophet Isaiah 
describes Noah and the flood as an event. Ezekiel says this happened. Peter, uh, the writer of Hebrews, does as well. Jesus himself, who we claim is the son of God, God himself in the flesh said, this happened. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all, Jesus said. And the same thing's going to happen again. Perhaps one other point of, of authenticity, uh, kind of like what we talked about in, in uh, the Easter sermon, that, you know what, the people in the days of Noah, they thought, Ain't going to happen. A big giant flood like this is not, Noah, you're nuts. They were just like the academics of our day. No way. And that, you know, that, that emphasizes the rationale and the reality of, yeah, this is something that is extraordinary and it's hard to believe. But the testimony from around the world of history and the testimony of Scripture and the testimony of the Son of God is this happened. And if this happened, man, we better take to heart. Why? There's other issues with this passage that you know academics and scholars would scoff at. The whole opening verses, you know, about the sons of God, uh, the Nephilim. Uh, if you read it, I'm going to send a video out later this week to kind of address some of these issues, but, but uh, there's issues around angelology, angels. Uh, there's Nephilim or understood as giants. What the heck? What, what, giant? What? You know, what? And so there's all these issues with this passage. How to understand this all. And again, I'm going to address some. We don't have time to address that this morning. But suffice it to say that the people who received this text for the first time they knew who the sons of God were. They knew who the Nephilim were. They didn't have a question of whether this was a historical event or not. Because all the other nations around them understood it as an historical event. The, the primary reason this passage was written wasn't to try to prove to us that it happened. It, it was written. It, it was assumed it had happened. It was written as a warning to our hearts. Uh, because we do the same thing as, well, the uh, peoples back then did. They, they, they took the story and they contorted it and changed it, took out the truth of it, and be, made it something that had no impact in reality on them at all. The same kind of way we kind of take the story of Noah and, 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 and make it such a sweet story about animals. It has no impact on us, really, at all. But here's what's written. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thought of his heart was only evil, continually. Uh, where'd that start? It started with Adam and Eve making a single choice. And then what Joe preached last week, chapter 4, uh, with Cain, you see this disposition of the heart uh, that that resented his brother, and, and he felt jilted towards God. And an anger rose up in him so much that he killed his brother. And then as you get to the end of chapter 4, you find out about Cain's descendant, Lamech, 
who, who then he embraces bigamy, just blows apart marriage as it was known and should have been. And he beats his chest and says that if Cain is to be avenged in his life seven times, then anything that anybody does to me, I'm avenging them seven times 70 myself. And he begins to build cities who end up being like a locust of evil. The, the intensity and growth of, of violence, you can just, it, you know, it just saturate it. You feel it. It, it. It all started with that little choice of Adam and Eve. Chapter 6, we're introduced to the daughters of men. And our passage says, well, you know, they were beautiful and attractive. That, you, you can translate the, the Hebrew word as that, but I think it makes far more sense to translate it in relationship to everything else before it. The word tobe is just good. The daughters of men, they were good. And somehow, some reason, the, the sons of God, in the way they interacted with their daughter, with, with the daughters of men, the goodness was stamped out. It was no long they weren't good everything about it so much so chapter one God saw all that he had made and it was good we get to chapter six the Lord saw same language the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of their hearts was evil continuously everything was good now everything was evil. Sin was crouching at the door, the Lord said to Cain. It's waiting to overtake you, waiting to control you. And here in chapter 6, it's taken full control of all people. Doesn't that break your heart? It, it sure broke the heart of God. He was grieved. He was troubled in his. That's what sin does to us. How? By, by first dismissing truth and not taking it to heart, not believing it. T taking what is true, fact, event. God's very presence, God's reality, God's goodness, and just beginning to toss it aside in, in looking the other way. We see the very nature of God, unlike all the other myth stories of the ancient Near East connected to the, this biblical account, the way, the way they go off, you find a consistent portrayal of the character of God as good, and he confronts evil, and he does the same thing you would do. Faced with total evil, he judges it. He brings judgment upon it. You wouldn't want it any other way if things were as they're characterized here in Scripture. God's goodness is upheld and that which is corrupt faces judgment. And yet in the midst of it all, there's this one guy, Noah. Noah. If you go back to the previous chapter 5, there's this line of people that are described as, well, they called on the name of the Lord. They called on the name of the Lord. Enoch uh, walked with God. Noah is described as walking with God. Noah is described as righteous. I don't think... He is any more righteous than anybody else in this room. He just did one simple thing. 
He called on the name of God. Uh, Hebrews describes uh, Noah by saying, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his family he condemned the world and became heirs of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. His righteousness was a righteousness of faith. He called on the name of the Lord. He didn't see everything, but he trusted what God said. That's what I want to encourage us to do, to be. To be people who call on the name of the Lord, who trust when God communicates to us through his word that it's true and that we live our lives in light of it. May it be so today. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that in some way you would help us grow in our trust in you, that we would understand what it means to have faith that we might be the the kind of people Noah was. Lord, we do pray that um, righteous judgment would come down upon that which should be judged. But we pray even more, Lord, for your mercy in the midst of it all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship uh, the Lord through song.
Would you pray with us? Lord God, we thank you for scripture and how it holds up a mirror to us and to our world. Because Lord, just as in the days of Noah, we see the brokenness and evil in our world. But Lord, we thank you also for scripture, how it testifies to your faithfulness. How, Lord, you told us that in this world we will have trouble. Lord, help us to take heart in the knowledge that you have overcome the world. Lord, we pray this morning, especially for those who are suffering and struggling. Lord, we pray for those who are battling illness, who care for those who are battling illness, who are aging, who are dealing with the brokenness of our bodies and our spirits. Lord, we pray that you would be close to those who are mourning, who are heartbroken this morning. Lord, we know that your scripture says that a bruised reed you will not break, that you are gentle at heart. Lord, come alongside those who need to be encouraged today. And Lord, encouraged and chastened by the scripture we have read today, help us to live new lives through your spirit. Help us to be a people who are known by our love in the midst of the division and demonization that is happening within our country, within our world. Help us to be people of light and love, those who perpetuate those problems. Lord, help us to be your hands and feet, to be salt and light in our world. And Lord, we do pray, especially for as we hear this scripture about the world being wracked by violence, we pray for those who are suffering because of violence all over the world, but especially in Haiti, in Ukraine, in Israel and Gaza. Lord, we just pray for an end to violence. We pray for those who are in power, officially or unofficially, who are making decisions that affect the lives of people made in your image. Lord, we just pray that they would be overcome with a heart of mercy rather than a spirit of violence, that they would recognize the worth of people who have been touched and whose lives have been ravaged by the violence in these places and in so many others, Lord. We just pray that you, as the Prince of Peace, would overcome all that is standing in the way of peace in our day. And Lord, we lift up to you the people of Triangle Grace Church and our loved ones. We pray for the students going on the mission trip to Costa Rica. We lift up Charlotte and Jake and Annalise, Landon and Landon and Lauren, Natalie and Nicholas, Megan, Bailey, Brandon, Julianne, Ella, and Turner. And we pray too for their leaders, for Megan, Rob, Mike, Jill, Pastor Jeff. We lift them up to you in their physical, spiritual, and emotional needs as they prepare to, to share the love of Christ with Pastor Sergio and Pastora Maria. And the, and the church and ministry partners there in Costa Rica. We ask for healing, Lord, for Jean Watkins and her bout with shingles. We lift up uh, Matt Lieber and Lucy Leland and pray for comfort and peace with Matt's battle with brain cancer. We pray, too, for the Hawkins daughter, Rosanna, and healing from anemia. And Lord, we lift up to you the Songs of Hope concert last evening. Uh, for the members who, who and covenant partners who came and friends and family and the musicians 
we, we thank you for that amazing opportunity and pray for continued blessing to our community through Triangle Grace Church. Lord, we thank you that scripture assures us that you hear our prayers. You hear our cries to you. However articulate or however groaning they are, Lord, that you hear, you know what we have on our hearts. Lord, we lift up those prayers and the ones that we have said this morning using uh, the words that you taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us give to the Lord our tithes and offerings. This is my Father's world. Into my listening ear, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the sphere. This is my father's work. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees. Of skies and seas, his hands a wonders bright. This is my father's world. The birds that carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare the maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. my father's world oh let me never forget that all oh, the wrong seems all so strong god is a ruler yeah this is my father's world why should my heart be sad the Lord is King, let heaven reign, God reigns, let the earth be glad. This is my Father's world, why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let heaven reign, God reigns, let the earth be glad.
Lord, we give you thanks for these gifts and for so many others that are represented in this congregation. Lord, we ask that you would use them and you would use us for your glory in this church, in our community, and throughout the world. We are so grateful for the many, many things that you have given us, Lord. Help us to give just a fraction back to you and to your people. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Now let us join together in singing our final hymn, 562, Rejoice Ye Pure at Heart. If you are in per, uh, need of prayer for any reason, there'll be some folks up here that would consider it a great privilege to pray with you about anything that might be upon your heart. There's refreshments across the way. We hope you'd enjoy, uh, you'd enjoy uh, taking part in some time of fellowship uh, after the service, uh, but now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Uh, may his face be turned towards you and grant you all of his peace this week. We pray in Jesus' name.